Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, my name is Francisco Barbosa. I'm a PhD student at Aarhus University. I have nothing to do with sexual medicine or uh, anything related to this, but I think it, I'm going to present to you a very interesting topic that can be used in multiple areas, including everything sexual medicine. Um, so, as I told you, I'm a PhD student at Aarhus University. My research focuses on multisensory perception and multisensory marketing. So, how the senses uh, influences, how the senses influence how we perceive the world. Um, so, uh, also I've done some research in virtual reality, mixed reality, haptics, and packaging. So, I have a background in finance, and yeah, now I change fields. So, thank you. So, how many of you? if you can raise your hands in the Zoom group and over here, have used Duolingo. At least uh, have dabbled in Duolingo trying to learn another language. Nobody? Okay, cool. Have you liked it? Yeah? Okay, cool. How many of you have used Fitbit, the app? Have you liked it? Do you continue using it? Okay, cool. How many of you have used Zombies Run? No, okay, so we'll get back to that. So, <laughs> yes, so uh, gamification is a very simple concept um, that has been around for a few decades, uh, well, maybe two decades. So it's basically incorporating uh, elements of the gaming industry into non-gaming context. Uh, for a specific purpose, and this specific purpose can be dissemination of information or behavior change. So Duolingo is a very uh, simple example because it's aiming to, uh, to get people to acquire language, at least some basic skills in a specific language, by incorporating elements of gaming. So we have leaderboards, which is one of the most common um, elements, and we have the social aspects as well. So, it doesn't have to be a game, it doesn't have to be um, purely an RPG game or a third person perspective game. It can be specific elements that we will see around. And Fitbit, of course, we have the social element and we have badges. So I think we all feel nice getting badges and beating friends and competing in this. So this is one of, uh, of the many elements that we can incorporate in different situations. And Zombies Run, so this goes a bit beyond because you have missions. So you have missions where you are a survivor or a hero and you have to run to escape the zombies or kill the zombies. So this is going beyond incorporating even more elements of storytelling, for instance, and missions. So as I told you, is this gamification principles, uh, we have uh, the, MDB, the MDE framework, which is very simple, um, kind of synthesizing all the gaming elements not all the gaming elements, but the basic elements we can incorporate uh, in this mechanics. So we have mechanics, which is basically how the designers of the gaming experience or the non-game experience, including elements, uh, have how the game works or how the experience works. So we have the setup. This can be spatial or temporal. So how specific the, the players are, the rules are going to play. We have the dynamics, which is our non, they, these are non-controlled by the game designers, and this progress as the players interact with the game. So these are specific for each player. The mechanics are not, they're fixed and they're uh, standard and constant with, uh, throughout the game. And the emotions, it's the affective state of the person, but also the interactions we want, we want players to have. So, uh, Go here, so it's the, the behaviors that we, we want them to have. So we have some examples here of game mechanics. So as I told you, this includes rules and set uh, systems and, and how the experience is going to play. So we have tasks, we have uh, avatars, we have worlds, how specific things, how it's gonna work. And dynamics, the behaviors that we want players to have and the emotions, what we want them to acquire. So, this sounds uh, a bit fairy tale -y. Oh, why would we uh, include gaming uh, elements in an experience? So as Duolingo and Fitbit might show, we still don't have data on the effectiveness of it, but we can engage people to modify their behaviors and acquire 
uh, information. We can also use it to gather data. We always want data, and that is very important. And we can get massive data with this. But why does it work? Uh, we're playing with uh, a few theories here, so the most important being the self-determination theory, flow theory, and cognitive load theory. So we want uh, participants to fulfill three basic needs, three basic psychological needs. Uh, we want them to uh, fulfill competence, uh, relatedness, and um, uh, autonomy. Uh, autonomy, yes. And flow theory, so we want people to get in a state of complete immersiveness with the content and the experience, so to make them learn better. And cognitive load theory, this is a bit controversial because um, the part, being part of the experience takes away from the learning content, but it also engages you. So there's a bit of, um, of a controversy there. There are paper, multiple papers that use multiple theories, but the self-determination theory, flow theory, and cognitive load theory are the most important ones, the ones that most, paper, uh, most papers and most uh, gamifications experience have used. So fundamentals, a few things that we need to consider. Um, intrinsic and extrinsic motivation is a key because going back to the self-determination theory, we want people to fulfill the three basic psychological needs. So we want to balance intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. We can uh, play with extrinsic motivation with leaderboards, uh, points, uh, the social aspect of, comp of competitiveness. Uh, but we also want, we, all, we don't want the extrinsic motivation to overcome the intrinsic motivation while they're engaging with the content. We also want, the, want it to be meaningful uh, because if people don't find it meaningful, they will just, even if they're engaged for a, for a little while, the novelty aspect will fade away. So we want them to be engaged and for that it needs to be meaningful. Uh, challenging, we, it needs to be challenging because the, we want people to fulfill their competence needs, that they're uh, achieving something and they're being uh, progressing throughout. Freedom to fail, this is very important because, uh, for example, with Duolingo, I don't know if you have experience or with Fitbit, uh, that if you, for example, lagged or you were sleepy one day and you didn't go for, for your run, if you feel like, oh, you cannot progress anymore or that, or that you fail, then you're completely unmotivated. So you don't, you don't want that in your gamification experience. You want people to continue. So uh, a way to do this is give them a free pass or a free out of jail card. Oh, uh, you can get a day's rest or if you didn't complete your challenge this day, you can continue, no problem. So we forgive you for this. Rapid feedback, we want to incorporate, um, the, we want to give people, participants, the feedback that they're progressing as well. Storytelling with engagement and aesthetics uh, it might be engaging, the game, the, game, the game might be engaging, but if it's not beautiful, uh, people don't like it. So surprisingly, visual and auditory elements are very important in gaming. It doesn't have to be photorealistic, but it has to be uh, beautiful to keep people engaged. A few problems. Uh, as I mentioned, balance between extrinsic versus in intrinsic motivation. So how far do we depend on the extrinsic motivations that they uh, nullify the intrinsic motivation that people have to engage with the content and the experience and what we want them to, to do. Uh, pointification, leaderboards can be very powerful, but they can take away from the experience and again, the intrinsic motivation. Dropouts, again, uh, they're very important because we want to either uh, change behavior, gather data, or disseminate information. So we don't want people, especially if we're doing long uh, longitudinal studies, we want people to continue with the experience. We need to mine our target audience. Um, it's not the same uh, people in their uh, older years with versus teenagers, for example. The motivations are very different and the things they like. So we move on from games to, from gamification to citizen science. So we, what we want with citizen science is to disseminate and collect data. And we have different cases for this depending on the involvement of the participants. So in the first case, we have contributory projects, and these are basically the researchers or the designers create the experience and they collect data and record data. Uh, in more collaborative projects, we have people analyze data as well. And I'll show you a few examples to ground this. Uh, for now, it's a bit 
uh, fuzzy, but I'll get back to it. In co-created projects, in this, we ask participants for their feedback to design things. So uh, we can have brainstorming sessions on uh, different problems. And I'll show you more examples about this. Uh, this one, uh, very quick, uh, how do we evaluate citizen science projects? Uh, first of all, the problem. We need to have a clear purpose. It's not uh, good enough to, have to do a gamification experience just because we want to, as with any technology. What is it that we're, we need to have a clear uh, idea of what we're measuring and what we want to convey? The, is what we're looking for being co-created or is, is it better just to collect data or have people uh, analyze their own, their own data or massive data? Is it the behavior that we're trying to change uh, in tune with the audience? Is it, congruent? is it congruent with the audience? And how we can maintain engagement? And so we can go back to all the things we can incorporate. Uh, we can incorporate leaderboards, we can incorporate points, we can incorporate even uh, games inside the different experiences. So to bring, to ground this a bit, I will show you some citizen science examples. Uh, how many of you have you heard of stall catchers? No? So this is a very famous uh, citizen science project in which, uh, so this was a game, a computer game, in which people just sign up and they watch very short video clips of uh, blood vessels in mice. So this short, in these short video clips, what they have to do is say whether they're flowing or they, or they stalled. So these mice have uh, Alzheimer. So they, want to, they need to identify blood vessels, either if they're flowing or stalled, and it, uh, indicate at, at each frame rate, at each frame, which ones are stalled. So this is a very powerful tool because it has given scientists uh, the opportunity to analyze massive amounts of data and, um, for Alzheimer's research. So it's massive, free almost data. Uh, Philo, it's another curious one uh, because it's a puzzle game. So if you see, this is basically a game and a puzzle. People still like it. This is a bit more of a game in which people have to uh, solve puzzles and uh, maximize the patterns in the columns in uh, RNA sequences. Then we have Folded. This is uh, probably one of the most famous ones. And in this one, participants or uh, gamers <laughs> uh, look at a 3D model of uh, specific proteins and they have to come up with ideas on how to fold it. So this one requires a bit more of, so this, this two are barriers to entry or barriers to play are very low because you don't need any, any know-how whatsoever. With this one, it's a bit harder because uh, researchers analyze the most creative solutions. Uh, not, not all the folding sequences are the best ones, so they analyze the, uh, the most efficient ones. And we have Eterna. So this is also with uh, sequences. It's also a puzzle game. So now sexual medicine. Here comes the, inner, uh, the interesting part. So we have a few examples with different uh, elements that I will highlight to ground a bit more. So we have testing is healthy. Uh, I know it's common in Norway in the Nordics, but how many of you have played a game in a cinema that you, you see a screen and with your phone you download, sorry, you download an app and you play a game that is on the, the, on the screen of the theater? Awesome. Have you liked those? Do you find them funny or entertaining? Hmm. Okay. So uh, how basic works is in the cinema before the movie starts and before the trailer starts, uh, this one was a 60, uh, 60 seconds campaign that it, first they presented a video and then they prompt you to download an app through a QR code. So uh, this was in Canada. So people downloaded a QR code and an app. They scanned a QR code and downloaded an app. And they put in the screen, uh, you could see some questions. They, they chose two out of five questions and people in the apps responded. So this was a purely dissemination strategy, but after, so it's, it's a quiz before you, you go to the cinema, I mean, when you go to the cinema, so before the movie, it's kind of a quiz. 
And after they responded to the question, they prompted, they provided some information for its testing centers and uh, some sexual health. So this was purely uh, dissemination. This one is uh, interesting because it's on uh, long-acting reversible uh, contraceptive. So this one, it has a very clear difference between the dissemination part and the gamification, the gamification part because if you see on the left-hand side, it's mostly information. Uh, you provided, this was an app for phone created, so they provided uh, a lot of information, mostly on how to get uh, larks, uh, what to expect, where to get it, and so on. But they also created five games. Uh, the, one of the games was, this was Sperm Busters. So it's basically like a, uh, like a spaceship busters where you have to kill the sperm. And not surprisingly, this was the most common and most liked uh, game. There were two trivia games. Um, so this was just quizzes. And, but the other most popular game was um, Crampamole. So it was like a whack-a-mole game with cramps. So not surprisingly, that was the second uh, most popular one. Uh, but this, this gives you an idea how, can, how simply we can incorporate some dissemination strategy with pure games. These are pure uh, mobile games. So, of course, this was very famous. We have one that it's uh, more social media oriented, uh, which is Ally Quest. This one was basically a board in which you could get information and discuss with peers. Uh, it was also a medicine tracker and a test center um, tracker. So this was uh, for young men who have sex with men, and it, was, it basically provided a, a comprehensive platform to, for sexual medicine to, to take care of themselves. And we have, this one is probably uh, the most popular and industry-oriented one. Uh, this one was public in 2019, and it was for uh, LBQ uh, women. So this one was a kind of competition in which uh, women signed up for it, and what they had to do was, what, they downloaded an app, and what they had to do was to guess different behaviors um, for a prize. So you betted points, you had a, a buffer, a budget of points, and they betted, they were presented with questions. So they had to bet whether or how many people or in their area or in different areas followed specific behaviors, uh, sexual behavior, uh, be sexual behaviors. So, and after that, once they betted, if they won, they got more points. But after that, for bonuses, uh, for bonus points, they have to answer questions uh, about themselves. So you have this um, multi-step uh, strategy in which you bet you, and you, at the end, you, uh, you could get uh, $10,000 uh, every, every month. So it was monetary incentive, it was a fun way to play, and you could get a lot of information. So this is part of the data gathering and dissemination strategy, because in, uh, in addition to that, you could also get information. So you, you can see the multitude of um, platforms and formats in in this gamification strategies. But you might be wondering, uh, do I need a gaming person to do this? Do I, need a, do I need to be a hardcore gamer or a programmer to do this? Not really. There are a lot of options to do this. Uh, some of the most common platforms are the ones you can see here. Um, they, they vary in terms of how much knowledge on programming you, do, uh, you need and they have very different uh, ways in which you can do it. So I will show you um, one uh, very, so we use Gametize for a um, food sustainability and health um, project, and we use Gametize. So I will show you a short clip, and we'll discuss it later. It has no audio, but, so, yes a bit of uh, introduction. So we wanted to uh, get people's, uh, we wanted to get information about people's uh, coffee behavior uh, and sustainable behaviors in coffee uh, 
uh, brewing and drinking. So uh, we know coffee is uh, in peril right now, climate change, but we also uh, want to look at the packaging. What types of packaging do they use? What type of brewing methods they use? Because they have different uh, carbon footprints. So what we wanted to do was to ask people for their behavior, kind of map uh, behaviors in different parts of the world, or well, we started small. Uh, but we also wanted to communicate people, uh, communicate what are the more, more sustainable practices in coffee drinking and sustainable. So we followed a small protocol. So the app asked you uh, what, were, what was the coffee you preferred and how many, your consumption habits, how many cups of coffee do you have per day, what type of uh, brewing method you used. And you see a lot of things there from uh, from V60 to French press to other things. Also, what types of things they add and the packaging they use. Do you use a reusable cup or do you use always paper cups and plastic cups? Drama. But we also want them to know um, which ones are the most sustainable practices. Uh, surprisingly, plastic paper is not the best one. So we, and of course, if you see some memes there, because we're also targeting young people, and yeah, we want them to be entertained. So the, the first part was gathering a lot of information. And the co-creation part is we want people to tell us uh, what the problem is. So we, we're mixing cit uh, the citizen science, uh, the collaborative projects, because we're also, we also want them to uh, to tell us what the problem is and come up with solutions. So here you have, we had some quizzes and some challenges. And this also had a, a social component because people could vote for other people's responses. So um, what was the most, sorry, what was the most, um, sorry, what were their consumption habits? Uh, for instance, if they, so they could vote for problems also. So we, we had the collaborative component. So this is a very low tech, but imagine this in, with your own problem and using virtual reality, for example, or, or augmented reality. You can have a snap, I don't know how many of you have Snapchat, uh, but making a Snapchat lens or a, a augmented reality filter is very easy. You just download uh, a software and you can create multiple experiences. So you can add this to gamification experiences and social problems, any type of problem, and engage people more. So just beyond a quiz or a space invader kind of game. So you can add augmented reality and have people look at themselves if, as if they're old or the world's on fire or you can have a big a spermatozoid attacking you. Think of, go crazy with it. Um, yes, so you can also include uh, uh, artificial intelligence in the back end, but uh, this is just the beginning. Um, yes, so this is a very interesting uh, part, and I would like to hear your comments, questions, concerns. <laughs>